Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Hearthstone. So today we're going to continue on with our deck building trend uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the role uh, the role of each player within a match and deck archetypes. And those two things are very different even though they go by the same name a lot. So I want to uh, explain the difference there and talk about the different sort of archetypes that exist in Hearthstone. It's really important when you're building decks to adhere to archetypes because generally speaking if you try to make a jack of all trades deck you'll actually make yourself less effective at most things. So um, we'll talk about roles, then we'll talk about archetypes. So let's get started. So let's talk about deck roles. So what I mean by a role is that essentially in every single card game, in every single trading card game of any kind, um, so Magic, so Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, all of them, essentially you will always have an aggressor and a controller. Okay, so you're always going to have somebody who's playing aggro and somebody who's playing control. Now, that doesn't matter what type of deck they're playing. It doesn't matter if both players are playing control decks or both players are playing aggro decks. Somebody is going to fill the role of being on the attack, and someone else is going to fill the role of being on defense. What I mean by that is essentially the first player to play a card has the momentum. They have the sort of, they've made the call. And then the other player has to respond. And so the other player can control it by killing it with a spell, or attacking it with a creature, or something. But generally speaking, the first player who plays a card is now on the attack, and the other person is trying to manage the other player's board and, and be on defense, essentially. Uh, now, some decks are more predisposed to this than others. So, for example, the Zoo, whoops, not at all, uh, the Zoo is a deck that is specialized particularly in attack. It wants to be on the attack a lot. Uh, we'll talk about how it can be uncontrolled as well, though. So, on the first turn, it is exceedingly likely that you will have spells to play, or, or rather creatures to play. You have uh, ten of them that are below, or one mana and below, and you have a bunch of them that are below three, in fact, the vast majority of the deck. So on turn one, as the zoo, it's very likely that you're going to play a card, and then your enemy is going to try to control you somehow. And so try to kill your creatures, try to make sure you don't have cards on the board. And so in that way, through the whole game, you're going to be continually putting car cards down, putting creatures down, and the enemy is going to continually be trying to control you. And essentially, this will be how it goes until the game ends. The conditions in that game are easy. If you can maintain your aggression and you can beat out their control, you will ultimately win. And if they can out-control you and make it so you don't have very much to play anymore, then the, term, then the game switches around and then they start to go on the attack by putting out big creatures that you, since your resources are depleted, can't really deal with anymore. And so there is always a point, or at least there is sometimes a point in matches, where uh, the roles switch around, so the control deck will become the aggressive deck. This is really especially the case with a deck like the Handlock. So even if the Handlock goes first, the overwhelming likelihood is that they will not be on the attack. Right? Even if on turn one they put out the Voidwalker, it's purely a defensive move. The other, uh, the opponent will probably just continue to attack over top, or, or attack into it and continue. The Handlock, almost universally, will sit back and let the other person be aggressive in the first three or four turns of the game, because that's not the point. The point is to wait until a magical point, about turn five, six, seven, somewhere in there, when you have uh, low health and you can put out big things for cheap, and essentially, you switch around, and so you become on the attack. You drop two Molten Giants and taunt them up, and you suddenly put down a Faceless Manipulator on something that matters. You put down a Rag, you put down Ysera, right? And so suddenly, mid-game, you switch around into being a very aggressive uh, player, and the opponent, who was formerly being aggressive, now has to control, or else you're just going to kill them. And so that's what I mean when I'm talking about roles. It doesn't matter if a deck is control-oriented or aggressive. What matters is how the actual game goes. And for the record, you win by being aggressive. That's really, really key. That isn't to say you win by building aggressive decks and playing aggressively all the time. But you, when a deck wins, it's because they have transitioned into the phase where they're putting out big threats on the board that the enemy can't deal with. So even control decks. Control decks are just about essentially waiting for a longer time before the aggressiveness starts. So in essence, uh, in every game of Hearthstone you're going to have an attacker and a defender, and those roles can switch, but uh, essentially that's the basic thing that I mean when I say role. Now, there are decks that are built 
specifically to take on those roles. And so that's where the deck archetypes come in. Generally speaking, there are three major categories, and within those we fit in a bunch of different ones. So there's aggro, which is you know a deck that is built specifically to be fast, put lots of small creatures on the board, do a lot of damage very quickly. Then there's mid-range, which uh, generally isn't as fast as aggro, but what it tends to do is control for a little bit, and then switch into an aggressive mode very quickly with having a lot of four drops, five drops, six drops, and, uh, and try then to overwhelm with very high value creatures in the mid game. And then control decks are built to just control the board as much as they can in the early game. They usually don't do anything especially interesting until turn four, five, six, seven, and then they start to bring really, really big, scary threats onto the board. And so it's in these control decks that you start to see Ysera and Ragnaros, and if we're dealing with priests, stuff like mind control, uh, pyroblasts with mages, things like this. A lot of very big, scary threats. And so the only difference, uh, I think a helpful way to think about it, is that the only difference in those decks is when they choose to win. Right? So every deck, every good deck is built with a victory condition in mind. When are you going to win the game? Aggro decks aim to win the game very early. Uh, mid-range decks aim to win the game in the mid-game. And control decks end, uh, aim to end the game at the very, very end. Uh, in the very late game when both players have 10 mana, usually. And so I've got a couple of examples from uh, each of those archetypes kicking around here. So uh, the zoo is a good example of a basic aggro deck. Um, it isn't it's a board control deck, and so it really wants to keep the, the board controlled and you want to make good efficient trades, but by function of the fact that it has so many short little uh, or, or low mana creatures, uh, it is primarily an aggro deck. If we go over instead to something like the handlock, which we've already talked about, this is your basic control deck. It has no interest in playing a lot of cards in the mid game. Um, it'll throw out a Twilight Drake or Mountain Giant. But by and large, we're talking about all of its big stuff comes at the end. Rag, Ysera, Molten Giants, that sort of a thing. Um, this deck is actually quite conservative for a handlock deck. I don't have Jaraxxus in here um, or anything of that nature, but usually they just sort of they get to the point at the end of the game where they have a lot of really, really big threats. Um, and that's the, the way that they win. Mid-range decks, uh, the most popular one these days is the uh, Mid-Rage Hunter that uh, Kalento has, or Life Coach is the other one. I've chosen Kalento here. Um, and so what we have is this deck tries to win in the middle of the game, probably around turn 7, 8, 9, somewhere like that. And so um, you have enough stuff to deal with in the early game. You have enough sort of uh, uh, cards to get a tempo advantage, it's called. And then you have creatures in the middle to sort of really capitalize on uh, the strength of your mid game. And so you have, in this particular deck, you have the animal companions that are really great in the early mid game, and you have the hound master to turn your early cards into mid game cards, which is a really excellent uh, thing to do. The Savannah High Main is like the quintessential uh, high end mid range card. It's going to be uh, the thing that really does clear out uh, a lot of boards and, and kills a lot of things and, uh, and wins you your games. And so um, and you've got Leroy in here and Stampede and Kodo for a nice strong uh, mid-game that sort of controls the board as well. The whole purpose of this deck is to control the game until about turn 5 or 6, and then turn it around and start being very aggressive. Um, and you can start doing that usually with one of the massive Starving Buzzard, uh, Timberwolf, Unleash the Hound combos. That's usually how this deck transitions from going control into being very aggressive. Um, Another example is a mid-range shaman. This uh, particular mid-range shaman I found on Hearthbone. It's uh, made by Nuba, and so um, essentially it's it's simple. It has uh, good strong early mid game, which is the same sort of thing that you would expect any shaman to have. Um, feral spirits, lightning storm, lots and lots of early control elements. But then the real power of the deck comes from filling up the board with stuff in the mid game. So you're controlling so hard that you can keep your totems out, you can keep your unbound elementals out, you can keep your feral spirits, you start to get the azure drakes, you do really efficient trades with fire elementals, and then once you've got a couple of creatures on the board, bloodlust becomes your win condition. And so really the win condition for this deck is having a lot of creatures, and presumably winning before late game. That's the key. With any mid-range deck, if it goes too long and you're playing against a control deck, you will absolutely lose, because the control deck will simply be able to out-control you and outlast you because that's what they're meant to do.
Um, ramp Druids, uh, my Ramp Druid deck, for instance, is a good example of sort of a mid to late game deck. It's not fully control and it's not fully mid range, but it is a sort of a combination. And the reason it's a combination is because Wild Growth and Mark of the Wild explode the deck forward. And so this is very late game focused, right? You have uh, nine, eight, three sevens, a bunch of sixes, three sixes. Um, the vast majority, or at least a lot of the cards, are sitting at five plus, which is usually your definition of a late game deck. But it is more mid range than it is late game in a lot of ways because your wild growths and your innervates will get these giant threats on the board way earlier than they should. And so as a result, they sort of your win condition is actually more in the mid game than the late. But because you have so many late game cards, it allows you to last into the late game if you're against a control deck and uh, and play with them until the end of it as well. So uh, that's where the advantage in this deck lies in being able to outlast as well as to get big threats on the board early. So those are the three basic archetypes. Now when you're building your own deck, it's really important to adhere to one of these archetypes. You want to know in your head, you need to pick in your head when you're going to win. Essentially, if you know when you're going to win, um, then you can start to build your cards and, and your deck around it. So a um, really good example is if you are, let's see here, let's pick any character. Um, right, so if you're going to play a Ramp Druid, Ramp Druid is a good example. If you're going to play a deck like this, if you're going to win in the late to mid game, you want to be looking at high level cards like the Ancient of Lore and the Ancient of War. You want efficient high end cards like the Druid of the Claw, that sort of thing. And what you don't want is cards like the Leper Gnome or things like this where you want, uh, where they kind of come out of the gate and are very explosive. Um, the only reason that Wild Pyro is in here, for instance, is because it helps with aggression. It is a 2-drop, so it's useful for that, but the real purpose of it is to play it later in the game with spells so that you can clear out their board. So it's not really a 2-drop, right? Um, a Ramp Druid like this doesn't have any reason to have things like, um, for instance, Dire Wolves or Fairy Dragons, even though they're really good cards, uh, and, and you know it's, it's tempting to have them in most decks. The Ramp Druid's entire purpose, the strength of the deck, is to the mid to the late game, and so having a lot of two drops is not going to be something that you want to clog up your deck with. It's the same exact thing with the handlock, um, right? You don't need a lot of little tiny creatures, even though the flame mip is amazing, you don't want them in this deck because you don't care about the early game, right? If you put these in there, you're putting cards in that instead could be later game cards that can help you control the end of the game, okay? Um, so you want to stick to your archetype and you want to know when it is you're going to win. It's the same reason why, for instance, in this mid-raid shaman deck, you want to win in the mid-game, which is why Ragnaros and Ysera aren't here. They are too slow, they're too late. With a deck like this where the top card is a 6, uh, you know that your, your uh, win condition is essentially going to be putting up a lot of things in the mid-to-late game, and if it goes on too late past turn 10, then you're going to struggle. So. Uh, that's essentially how these all work. So, uh, just essentially, uh, the, the real take-home from this video, I hope, the real take-home from these archetypes and that sort of a thing, is to understand when your deck is going to win. When you are building your own deck, you need to have a conception in your mind of when exactly you're going to win. If it's going to be early, then you need to play uh, a lot of early aggressive cards. So if you decide you're going to win in the early game, you're going to want things like the Leper Gnome, you're going to want things like Abusive Sergeants, um, you're going to want strong 1, 2, and 3 drops. If you decide that you're going to play in the mid game, you're going to want strong 3, 4, 5 drops. So, I mean, that's when Shattered Sun Cleric comes in, that's when Yetis are there, uh, Defenders of Argus, Dark Iron Dwarves, those sort of things. And if you want to win in the late game, what you need is a class that has a lot of strong controlling options. The Mage is a good one. When you have a lot of things like Arcane Missiles, you have things like uh, Frost Bolts and uh, various cards like this to really control in the mid game without using or control in the early and mid game without using a lot of cards but while having a large effect so fireball polymorph cone of cold these things are all very controlling cards and then what you usually want to do is win in the late game with big guys like we're talking um, five plus essentially we're talking about tigers we're talking about argent commanders boulder fist ogres uh, venture comarks even there um, you know cards like Sylvanas and Rag and all the big fat legendaries. Generally speaking, the earlier you want to win, the cheaper the deck is to build. So if you're just new to the game, 
usually aggressive decks are actually going to be much easier for you because um, a lot of these cards are basic and a lot of these cards are, are not above uh, uncommon or rare, right? They, um, like Hungry Crab is very situational. The rest of these cards, Leper Gnome is, is common, um, Shield Bearer for Zoo is common, uh, Work and Infiltrator, Mani Berserker, all common stuff. You know, there's a couple of rares. But when you get into the late game, and when you start doing uh, mid-range and control decks, they start to get very expensive. And so, like, these are all legendaries up here. And so they're very big and scary, but they also cost a lot. So if you don't have um, a lot of resources, if you're new to the game, you're not going to want to try to build control decks. You're going to want to try to go aggro. So um, that's the basics of building towards a deck archetype. Um, so next time what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to build the core of your deck, uh, the core of a, a new deck built to a certain standard, and then how to fill in that core with sort of uh, meta-based cards and that sort of a thing. So um, I hope this was helpful for you. Um, if you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.